So as that opening video for the forum showed, it's been a very busy year uh, for the global media as conflicts and challenges uh, continue around the world. Against that backdrop, the world continues to evolve in a number of ways, which sets the theme for the Eurasian Media Forum this year. One key feature of this gathering is that you get to ask the questions and take part with your questions and comments. You help to shape the discussion. So please make the most of the remarkable guests that we have uh, uh, attending here from around the world so you can ask your uh, questions and share your experiences as well. And let's create a high level of candid conversation. When the time comes, I'll ask you to, to uh, offer those questions up and please keep them brief and your comments brief so we can get to as many as possible. So our first panel session takes a look at the evolution of international relations, global cooling. There's been some irony in the fact that the planet's undergoing global warming while international relations seem to be going global coo cooling. Uh, more than a quarter of a century after the Cold War ended, we're back to hearing the language of division, and many of the trends emerging seem to reflect that bygone era. Sanctions, trade barriers, media restrictions, so in the next 90 minutes, we're going to explore what's triggered and what's fueling this move away from global, global unity and cooperation. Why are so many, so many nations facing uh, growing populism and looking inwards and seeing threats in everything from immigration to economic growth? You're stuck with me as a moderator for this first session, uh, but you'll be glad to know there's an excellent panel lined up to compensate for that. So let's invite them up. I ask up, please, first to come up the uh, Minister of the Foreign Affairs for the Republic of Kazakhstan, Mr. Khairat Abdurakmanov. Welcome, sir. We also have Mr. Matteo Renzi, the former Prime Minister of Italy. Please come on up, sir. David Chikvadze is the uh, head of the Secretariat of the Director General of the UN Office in Geneva. Thank you for joining us as well, sir. Hi, welcome. Mr. Simon McGee, he served as exe uh, UK Foreign Office Press Secretary and is Executive Director in APCO's Global Solutions Practice in the UK. Come on up, please, Simon. Thank you, sir. And we have Mr. Ahmed Mohammed uh, Al Jarwan, who is a member of the Federal National Council of the UAE uh, and President of the Global Council for Tolerance and Peace. Thank you, sir. Come on up. And we have Ambassador Gary Locke, who served as USA's Ambassador to China. Uh, and he's joining us as well from the USA. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Come join us. We are trying to keep the speeches uh, to a minimum so we can have a more candid and interactive discussion. Uh, again, it's very much your conference, your forum, so we want you to take part. But what I'll do is um, I'm going to start off with a question to each of our... Uh, our uh, panelists to get an idea of how they see this evolution in the world uh, with the global cooling. So I, I'm going to kick off first with um, our, our Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs from the Republic of Kazakhstan, Mr. Khairat uh, Abdurakmanov. Uh, he's uh, held some very, very senior postings, including ambassadorial postings for Kazakhstan at the United Nations, Austria, Israel, and the OSCE, among others. We're very honored you could join us today, sir. I guess one of the things that strikes me about having come to Kazakhstan since the beginning of the millennium, new millennium, is I get the sense Kazakhstan is a country that's always trying to kind of unite uh, other countries. We've, we've heard President uh, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev talk about getting rid of the G20 and bringing it more like a G global, bringing the world together, and Kazakhstan's held its doors open. How do you, considering the position Kazakhstan has, regard the way the world community seems to be splitting in, in so many areas? Well, th thank you. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. I'm extremely thankful to the organizers of this media forum for inviting me to address such a distinguished fora. And as a, as a sort of son-in-law of journalism, I would like to take this splendid opportunity and to pay a tribute to what our distinguished journalists and representatives of mass media are doing in order to make an objective, true coverage of all these events which we just now observed in front of us on screen. Obviously, it goes without saying that to the most of the events which we just now watched on uh, a video screen, my president, Sultan Nazarbayev of Kazakhstan, has been engaged. It works? Oh, yeah, please. Uh, except probably the uh, late last scene of royal wedding, so... Uh, and it, it means... Uh, 
It's high tech. The, finally, we are coming back to. The Sorry, technology is against us today. Digit, it's very, and this is what I am trying to convince some people also in our society that digitalization means a lot. So it's not just simply words, but also deeds. So thank you very much for um, this chance just to tell to this distinguished audience that Kazakhstan is heavily engaged in all, in all these uh, uh, events. Since our last meeting, and I really did enjoy last, exactly one year ago in, um, in Astana to address the participants of this forum, there are many things happened. Among them, our uh, membership, non-permanent membership, along with Italy, by the way, at the United Nations Security Council, where we successfully uh, run a presidency in January of this year. It was the opening of the first ever low-enriched uranium bank in Kazakhstan. It was an Astana process on Syria, and there are other series of events where we uh, take uh, direct participation. But in order to uh, prove that Kazakhstan is really a true bridge between East and West, between Asia and Europe, I have to reflect in uh, some very short, maybe, sentences referring to my note, my observation, our observation of the state of play at international arena. So first of all, let me to mention that today we are witnessing the transformation of international relations. The modern world has entered a stage of high turbulence and unpredictability. There are many proofs for that. I will not spare time to name all of them. We see a new highly competitive world order which characterized by in particular, very much fierce, very much tough interstate rivalry, including in the military, political, information, cyber, economic spaces, as well as active use of proxy war tactics. The systematic crisis of confidence in international relations, this is what is worrying my leadership at this very moment. Degradation of culture of international diplomatic dialogue, uh, again, we have a lot of samples to, uh, to prove that this is a, a, a matter of major concern. The emergence of many non-state centers of power and influence deliberately or subversively challenging the interests of power of national states and international organizations. This is also one of the factors of international relations today. And this process is accompanied by a general chaos of international relations, diametrically different interpretation of the fundamental norms of international law. And just this uh, month we had a chance to uh, listen to the debates at the United Nations Security <laughs> Council where <laughs> Kazakhstan <coughs> to actively participate. But from our perspectives, the situation is, is not as gloomy as I tried to describe now. And that's why Kazakhstan and our uh, allies cannot stay as a bystanders to all these processes. I would like to mention, distinguished um, uh, moderator, that despite many contradictions, ambiguities, as well as challenges, it is an exaggeration to compare the current international situation with the dark times of Cold War. And Kazakhstan has every right to reflect on it. As soon as the Kazakhstan was a border of the Cold War between Soviet Union and China. But today we managed to convert this 1,700 long, uh, kilometers long border into the border of friendship, people exchange, uh, cooperation, trade and investments. There are many other uh, you know, positive uh, achievements, accomplishments of the world. For example, we managed to tackle issues of poverty, probably mostly because of the contribution of China and Brazil, but at the same time, the renowned UN SDGs we are all fighting for and uh, for implementing all of them are vivid example that heads of state and government can be united around some of our common goals and achievements. So uh, we, again, uh, and our diplomacy, not only of the Kazakh diplomacy, of, 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 but of the, all the progressive uh, humankind cannot stand aside of all these processes and we are trying to make our best in, in, in order to contribute. 
From that perspective, I would like just to ask the kind attention, I mean, kind attention, to draw kind attention of journalists to the devils which are in details. When we are, for example, covering Astana process on Syria, there is quite a criticism on behalf of your distinguished uh, colleagues, journalists, and needless to say about politicians. But when I am talking about details, when you witness this withdrawal of terrorist uh, groups, as well as of armed uh, opposition groups from Eastern Ghouta. There were three groups, as, as you remember, Jaysh al-Islam, Fayek al-Rahman, as well as Akhrar al-Sham. All of them participated into the Astana process. Even more, the head of the armed opposition, Syrian armed opposition delegation was, uh, was Mr. Mohammed Alush on behalf of Jaysh al-Islam. And this withdrawal became, uh, you know, possible only because of the Astana process and the agreements reached here between and among, uh, for example, uh, guarantor states of Russia, uh, Iran, and Turkey, as well as uh, Syrian government and armed opposition groups. This is a practical contribution where we are, by all means, trying to reduce not only same uh, tension in the region and not only in Syria, but uh, far beyond. But this is a practical contribution on behalf of uh, my uh, leadership. So uh, with this, with your permission, I will, I will I just uh, giving some uh, food for thoughts for further deliberations and I will be very much happy to uh, answer to any questions uh, you may have. Thank, Thank you very you much. Thank you very much, Minister. Thank you. And actually, you raise an interesting point. It's good to hear your optimism and you're right. It's, uh, this is one of the, the key issues we're discussing at this forum. Is this evolution uh, of the media too? And the point you raise about sometimes it creates a wrong picture for a lot of people of the real situation. So that's why we're discussing it. And I think uh, having uh, Matteo Renzi, I think this is an interesting point for you, sir, um, where you have experience uh, or you have a, an opinion and experience on the way media and politics interacts. And I wonder, listening to the minister there, what you, what you think about the way that media political interaction has evolved. So I, I think really everything has changed in the last uh, 15 years. When... Um, a person Nazarbayeva explains us to the great history of the last uh, 15 years. Uh, I imagine uh, this iPhone uh, is not in our pockets 15 years ago. Uh, 15 years ago, iPhone uh, was uh, in the mind maybe of uh, Steve Jobs, uh, and the mobile was only mobile. Now is mobile is. Uh, uh, photo camera is uh, an instrument for everything. And this incredible change changed also the um, ability for politicians to uh, create uh, strategies and uh, opportunities. Uh, if I think about uh, Europe, uh, I consider that uh, an absolutely opportunity and occasion, but at the same time, I know we have a lot of risks. If I read a newspaper, an article about the relation between media and politics in Europe, I read every time an article about the risks of communication and of political uh, uh, link between communication and politics. But let me be very clear, every, every era, every season of the life uh, gave us opportunities and risks. And for that, uh, I think, if for my father, for my grandfather, the, the mission was uh, fight against Nazi fascism, if for my generation uh, the mission uh, is uh, fight against uh, um, extremism and uh, Islamic terrorism, maybe for our son and our grandson, the mission will be fight against uh, uh, problems uh, of uh, uh, cybersecurity, uh, problems uh, linked of uh, um, art intelli art artificial intelligence. Uh, so, my view is that we have in every part of our life a lot of opportunities and the risks. Now, I think it's time to discover a new vision focused on the values, on the cultural dialogue. And this is absolutely priority for Europe. Uh, His Excellency explains us a very important efforts for, for Syria, for uh, dialogue at high level in uh, a lot of uh, fields. 
if we think about uh, the new opportunities in North Korea, in um, uh, a relation between uh, uh, China and Russia, Russia and the USA, the problems and opportunities, we, we, we understand the possibilities in front of us. But, and this is my personal view as former Prime Minister of Italy, we need a stronger Europe in this dialogue. Because if Kazakhstan, and uh, I agree with you, Your Excellency, uh, try in the last period to be a bridge of dialogue, of uh, cultural dialogue in, uh, between Asia and uh, Europe, I think now we, we need a more efficient and more able look of uh, Europe. Uh, and uh, this is my consideration. I think Europe have a lot of things to do. Just one example, and I stop my first uh, remarks. When I was Prime Minister, a lot of times we discussed in Europe uh, about a very important agenda, fight against uh, Daesh, uh, fight uh, against violence, uh, uh, investment uh, for Africa. You know, the agenda is always the same. But we lost the ability to understand what is really Europe today. Europe is the only experience in the history of the last two centuries of creation of peace after centuries of civil war. Is a process of peace unbelievable in the, in the books of history. And uh, Europe lost herself in the technical approach, in the debates of technicians and also of politicians without a value, without a soul, a, a, a different look. So the momentum, very important, in which I understood what is Europe and what is important in this time of history for Europe to be protagonist around the world was January 11, 2015. Why? Because uh, this uh, day in Paris, France, President Hollande, former President Hollande, invite every leader in Europe and uh, outside of Europe to give a message against extremism and violence after Charlie Hebdo killing. And the very incredible thing is that for the first time, not the leader make history, but the leader was blocked in the bus looking thousand and thousand, hundreds of thousands of people who singing the national anthem, the Marseillaise, Allons Enfants de la Patrie, and in Paris to give a message of reaction against violence and against terrorism. I think that we can discuss for a lot of time about uh, a relation between politics and the communication. But the real challenge is when the people understood what is the role to change everything. And I, am, I touch European values, not in the meeting with my former colleagues, uh, chief of state, uh, head of state, head of government, but when the people singing in the streets and the leader were blocked in the buses to look the history. I think we need that, more values and less, a less technical approach. Senior Enzi, thank you very much, sir. <laughs> Dr. David uh, Chikvaize is the head of the Secretariat and Director General of the UN Office in Geneva and has had uh, prominent roles within the UN, including the Office of Humanitarian Affairs. And sir, taking it back up from the people level and values, which of course we will discuss more, uh, we also have this, the United Nations, we have a world body that's supposed to be the platform for a lot of discussions. And I wonder, when you look at the way uh, we've evolved in the last few years, how that body works and the way the, the, the member states work within it uh, in terms of either creating unity or disunity. Thank you very much. I'll try this technology. Sure. I think it works. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Nazarbayeva for her leadership in this forum and for her invitation. It is a great honor to be participating in the 15th anniversary edition. Um, 
in answer to your question, and also with regard to this 15 years, um, I think we need to go a little further back. Um, it's almost become axiomatic that uh, uh, you know, everything starts with the, with the end of the bipolar world. Uh, indeed it does, but in the, in the case of the evolution of international relations, I would even go back further. I would even go back to 1985 with the advent of Gorbachev. Because at that time, starting with uh, the advent of Gorbachev, the collective West, uh, especially in Washington, I was in Washington at the time, could not figure out, was this guy for real? Was this guy a fake? Uh, they didn't use that word back then. Um, and since then, there has been this uh, absence, uh, actually on both sides, it's a two-way street, absence of a set policy based on uh, stable political um, uh, directions. It, what we have had in the past, especially the past 27 years, is a set of reactions to the other side's actions and vice versa. And that's no way to run a railroad anywhere, especially when you have um, a world that has become fragmented, as has been said uh, many times here. The, uh, the world today needs adult supervision. Unfortunately, those who would provide adult supervision are themselves in need of adult supervision. So what we wind up with is having uh, a proliferation of regional, uh, regional uh, players, countries, uh, who are, most of them are not acting as Kazakhstan is. Kazakhstan is uh, probably a, I'm not saying this because uh, Dr. Nazarbayev is here, or because we are in Kazakhstan, is one of the most responsible, uh, mature, and adult countries, and uh, is playing a role that is probably, it's punching above its weight. Unfortunately, and in the UN we don't name countries, we name problems, unfortunately, other similar countries that would be playing such roles are playing destructive roles. They are uh, engaging in proxy wars. They are uh, taking very, very um, heavy sides and are engaging in uh, double standards uh, that are off the charts. Um, add to this the fact that uh, we have a, a changing nature of conflict. The conflicts have been mixed in uh, with, with uh, criminal elements have been mixed in with terrorism. Um, all this breeds incredible trust deficit. Now, these things cannot not reverberate on the international structures because the United Nations system is a, a mirror image of, of its member states. Very often, and we ourselves in the UN are, are culpable in this, and I'm sorry to be going on uh, a little bit longer, but uh, you know, some of our colleagues in the UN write into the Secretary General's speeches when he's visiting a country saying, well, I want to thank the uh, President or Foreign Minister of Country X for excellent cooperation. No, I'm sorry, I usually scratch that out. Countries don't cooperate with the organization they create. Countries run the organization they created. <clears throat> However, therein lies the problem. They do not run the organization well. What they do, and this organization, especially the United Nations Secretariat and the United <clears throat> Nations as the principal five organs, was created by the member states to have a haven of diplomacy where they could come in and discuss their problems and find, look together for resolutions of these problems the problems that they could not resolve outside of these structures. What happens today, unfortunately, is that these member states bring in their street brawls from the outside into the organs of the United Nations. Thus, the organs of the United Nations not being created to uh, offer a good uh, boxing ring, uh, they do not manage to help in the search for resolutions because there is no search for resolutions. It's scoring points against each other. So uh, today, we can't even talk about the P5, the permanent five members of the Security Council. We talk about the P3 and the P2. 
Uh, so this kind of fragmentation leads to uh, the organization sort of waiting for leadership. Of course, we're not sitting around waiting. However, uh, 73 years after its creation, the member states should tell the UN what it is supposed to do, and they should try to use the UN structures as they were meant to be. Right now, unfortunately, the uh, upshot is, well, if the UN doesn't take this or that side, it's irrelevant. I'm sorry it's not. Thank you, Seth. Thank you. Now, I'm sure we're going to revisit the points you've made there because it does uh, create an interesting juxtaposition to what we've been discussing. Um, Ambassador Gary Locke, good to have you with us as well, sir. Ambassador Locke, of course, was U.S. ambassador to China and spent more than three decades working with uh, China, giving him a remarkable depth and breadth of knowledge when it comes to U.S.-China uh, relations. And he also served as U.S. Secretary of uh, Commerce and Governor of Washington twice as well, Washington State. So uh, I know, Governor, I mean, Ambassador, you have a, an interesting uh, perspective on, on the way we describe the, the tensions in the world, that perhaps the fear people have in each country is less... Uh, about the impact of globalization, but more directly at home, the impact of automization, artificial intelligence, roboticization of jobs, and so on. Uh, I want to get your perspective on that, please, sir. Well, I really believe that uh, so much of the tension that we're seeing within countries and between countries is the... Sir, I'm going to ask you, just move the microphone a bit closer to you. That's is the uh, perception or the uh, misperception that globalization has been the cause of the economic... Uh, uh, dislocation within each of the countries. Uh, certainly in the United States, so many of the workers there blame China and blame globalization, whether the outsourcing of jobs to Mexico or China or India and many other parts of the world for the cause of the economic stress of America. And I think we're seeing that uh, in other parts of the world as well. Uh, and I see that uh, uh, having served as, as a governor of the state of Washington, and this is on the Pacific. Uh, this is very different from Washington, D.C. We call ourselves the, the better Washington in America, uh, the more sane and rational Washington. But I see it as a governor because I think all politicians are very concerned about jobs for their people. Uh, and we, I saw that as ambassador to China where the United States uh, and certainly President Trump blames uh, globalization outsourcing for the loss of jobs in America. I really think that a lot of this dislocation is because of automation, uh, robotics. Uh, and we're going to see even more of that over the next several years. Uh, McKinsey estimates that in 12 years from now, when the world's population is 8.5 billion people, anywhere from 400 to 800 million people will have their jobs displaced due to automation and artificial intelligence. Now that's going to fall disproportionately on the more advanced industrial countries. And so if the population of the world is about 8.5 billion, and let's say McKinsey is right that there's 800 million jobs that will be displaced, that's 10%. But if you look at many of the more advanced countries compared to the uh, emerging countries, artificial intelligence, automation, robotics will have a bigger impact in those countries, and so the percentage of jobs that will be lost could be anywhere from 10 to 20 percent. That's going to create huge economic stress and social stress and political instability, which we're already seeing in America, we're already seeing in Europe, and we're seeing in many other parts of the world. So I really think that uh, um, we need to under, have a, a better sense and understanding of the role of technology in economics. And that really, uh, you know, this conference, uh, uh, Euro-Asia uh, Media Forum, we're talking about the role of media. I think it's really important for media to really take a, a hard look and educate the world as to what are all the forces causing these dislocations. It's not the huge migration of immigrants into America. Uh, and certainly uh, the, the mass migration of, of refugees from the Middle East into Europe has exacerbated the problems. But when you have fewer and fewer jobs because of automation and technology and now artificial intelligence, it's going to create even bigger problems in Europe, in America, and many other parts of the world. And that's where it's incumbent upon me to, to really talk about this. For instance, in Detroit, where we make automobiles. The number of people that's required to make, let's say, the same number of automobiles, 100,000 automobiles today, is perhaps only one-third the number of workers required 20 years ago. The number of workers in my state of Washington to saw logs, to convert timber, raw logs and timber, into 
finished lumber is probably about one-third to one-fourth the number of people that it was required 15, 20 years ago. That's not because of outsourcing. Yeah. It's not because of outsourcing. It's because of technology, the use of computers in the sawmills to decide how those logs coming in uh, are, are cut up, the, num the amount of technology and mechanization in the mountains to cut down those trees instead of using human people or human, human beings. So I think we really have, uh, we really need media to talk about it. And, and in the opening statement, we had the Minister of Information from Kazakhstan talking about how people are using their own personal media and social media to get their news instead of traditional media. That's a challenge because when people are using social media, they're just talking among themselves and sharing their own prejudices and talking about people who s share the same views and opinions. It may not really be all that accurate. So this is a huge challenge for media. Uh, uh, and communications throughout the world as we face an increasingly um, uh, high-tech, advanced uh, technological world. Thank you, Ambassador. And interestingly enough, I was recently doing some interviews specifically on the impact of AI and robotization on, on uh, jobs. Some sectors, 72%. Uh, job losses, some 40%, so you're right, it's, it's going to affect certain sectors far more, uh, and we'll certainly look at that as we continue the discussion. Uh, Simon McGee, uh, good to have you with us as well. Um, the, the word populism has become more and more a part of our vocabulary. Again, I, I, as a journalist, I wonder where the words start to become popular. We had nationalism, we've had, you know, anything from extremism onwards. Where do you see populism fitting into the big picture and, and, and the root causes of it? Is it, is it something we should fear? Um, Riz, thank you very much, and it's great to be here, and thank you also to Dr. Nazarbayeva for the invitation. It's wonderful to be here on this uh, uh, panel today. Um, populism, uh, I suppose what is populism? It's being bandied about um, very readily by, by, uh, by everyone at the moment, by commentators, journalists, all of us um, here at these kinds of um, gatherings. I think um, it might be worth uh, asking the question, what's the difference between populism and, and popular? Um, in terms of how I see populism, I see it very much as a pretty simple equation. It's the equation of um, uh, a ruling class that's, uh, that stopped listening, uh, that became complacent. It's uh, about uh, um, perhaps um, people uh, who feel disenfranchised, who, who feel that the ruling classes are listening, uh, weren't listening sufficiently, uh, and then new political forces coming in to fill um, that space uh, and then the term populism possibly coming from the ruling uh, elites, um, uh, labeling those Johnny-come-latelys as, as populists. Um, I suppose the distinction between um, populism and popular uh, is, is solely whether you agree with them or not. <laughs> um, I, I also wonder to what extent um, populism is uh, deemed by many to be... Uh, a term for those of the extreme left or the extreme right um, is, uh, was Emmanuel Macron um, and En Marche, a populist movement or a popular movement? Um, I think that's a, a, an inter interesting question which I think I'd like to, to see teased out um, here today, possibly amongst this panel or, or the other sessions. Um, but the rise of populism, is it, is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Um, is populism simply uh, a, a shock to the system? Uh, is it simply a corrective on where people, where the ruling elites um, have forgotten where they're going? Uh, is it about um, uh, snapping people out of their complacency uh, uh, and reminding them um, that actually once in a while they need to sit up, listen, uh, and, and think again? And of course, um, I mean, Gary was talking about technology and auto automation in particular. Um, but of course, uh, all of this is now being done in the context of of social media, as, as we saw earlier, heard earlier um, in the introduction. So um, populism, good thing, bad thing. Can populism actually, uh, is actually populism a, uh, a good thing? We think of populism as definitely a bad thing. But um, actually, is it simply the people bypassing uh, the mainstream media uh, and the political elites and speaking directly to the top? Is that what we're seeing with Trump, actually? There is a hotline between ordinary folk uh, and, uh, and, and the U.S. executive. Um, uh, so, so just a few thoughts there to start with. A quick thought, though, it, do, it doesn't necessarily equate to nationalism, then. It can be beyond that and just be within the social structures. And well, I mean, I don't think of it as nationalism. I'm sure maybe, maybe other people do think of it um, as, uh, uh, as nationalism. I suppose that's the way that the term is, uh, is being used. I mean, 
uh, you know, what, what is populism? Populism seems to be a sort of a, um, uh, a, term, a term of uh, denigration by, by those uh, in power and those uh, in the establishment against people on the outside of the establishment who are challenging them. Um, I mean, that's how I see it. Others perhaps see it in a, in a different way. Well, we'll certainly talk more about that as we get going. Um, and uh, I'd like to also welcome in our final panelist here, His Excellency Ahmed bin Mohammed Al Jarwan, who is a member of the Federal National Council of the UAE. And he's president of the uh, Global Council for Tolerance and Peace. And, and I wonder, sir, here, you have a challenge. Uh, you try to promote global tolerance and peace at a time when, in many parts of the world, at least, we see it, it's actually diminishing. I want to get your perspective on that and how perhaps you've seen it evolve in the coming years. Well, thank you very much, and I just would like to thank Your Excellency, Dr. Basayev and the audience, and for this good opportunity to present, let me say, the Global Council for Tolerance and Peace, where we need to uplift the values of tolerance and peace, especially the states, and the media is invited also to support us in, in spreading this culture among the youth and among everyone. So. Uh, the Global Council for Tolerance and Peace is an organization meant for, to spread uh, the culture of tolerance and peace and to invite those who are uh, willing to, to work with us and to support us in spreading this, this culture. Uh, as you know, uh, for the last um, 10, 15 years uh, ago, uh, there's many discriminations raised in, in terrorism, uh, uh, killing here and there. So we need, to, we need to, to work together. We need to accept each other. We need to work together between all religions, Muslim, Christian, Judaism, other uh, religions. We need to work together. So we need to raise this culture to accept each other. So here where we are, we are inviting everyone, inviting uh, audience here to, to, to share with us, to support us in spreading this culture. Thank you, sir. We will again uh, get into all this. I want to just say it's open for your Q&A and comments um, from now. So if you do have a, a question, please put up your hands and we'll get you the microphone and continue the discussion. Do we have the microphones? Tell us who you are, where you're from as well, sir, and please keep the comments brief. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Dr. Shahid Qureshi. I'm editor of the London Post and a visiting professor in uh, Hebei professor. University in China. Uh, my question to the uh, Kazakh foreign minister is that you have done quite a hard work in Astana, Syria process, but what problems you are facing when you see your partner, for example, the United States is supporting the YPJ, which is a terrorist group uh, doing terrorism in Turkey. Does it make your job difficult? And my question to the US ambassador is, uh, you said that technology is the problem, uh, uh, and, and the evidence shows that technology is not the problem, it's the corrupt banking system, which is causing the terrorist financing as well as the, um, uh, uh, the war profiteering. These are the problems which the world is facing, not the technology. Technology has been, always been useful. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Minister, in terms of a question, it, it's, you know, we, we're not really tackling direct politics. Uh, in this, um, in this sort of discussion, in this session, but I leave you, Minister, to discuss, uh, to answer the question as you see fit. Well, it's my chance, and this is the best ever chance, uh, to reiterate that Astana process is about very much narrow segment of the settlement of situ peaceful settlement of situation in uh, Syria. It is about the so-called so -called ceasefire agreement reached by the end of 2016 between government and uh, Syrian armed opposition groups. There are 65 of them out of 100 plus probably, you know uh, better. And the uniqueness of that forum is that there are three guarantor states of Russian Federation, Islamic Republic of Iran and the Republic of Turkey. You agree that each and every of them pursuing their own goals. Sometimes they're in contradiction between and among themselves. But this is the uniqueness of this platform when under the leadership of President Nazarbayev and Kazakhstan as a host country, all these above mentioned stakeholders found a place which is very much con conducive and with very much favorable 
literally climate, poly, first of all, political climate, of course, for leading and putting forward a negotiations on peaceful settlement. That's why, it, and this was a sort of, let's call it, precondition for us to host this very much forum. That all these uh, parties are not bringing here contradictions which obviously existing in and in between and among themselves. And it was again, the, uh, I uh, already gave a, a couple of interviews and when I mentioned that, at the, for example, it was in January last year in 2017 when at certain moment the uh, Syrian armed opposition group led by above mentioned Mohammed Alush refused to enter the room at our venue. And only after they received a sort of guarantees on behalf of the host country, paying respect to the contribution, and this is, I'm quoting him, we are entering this room respecting President Nursultan Nazarbayev and Kazakhstan for its clear, open policy of honest broker, impartial player in this process. That's why when you are referring to some other, you know, uh, events going side by side with this peaceful settlement, uh, please take it into uh, your uh, very thorough uh, consideration. I thank you. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Ambassador Locke, a quick thought on the, um, the, the perspective on technology that our gentleman uh, offered. Well, I'm not blaming technology. Uh, technology will always uh, lead to changes in economics. I'm just saying that a lot of the resentment and the fear, for, for instance, among the American people, American workers, is that they want to blame other things. They want to blame uh, outsourcing. They want to blame immigration. They want to uh, blame other countries uh, for the problems that we face within our own economies. And I think that that's why we have this populism that we have in the United States uh, to be America first. Uh, and we have uh, President Trump resonates with many of the people who have been dislocated because he promises to take them back to the past, to restore things the way they used to be, even though that we know that we cannot go back to the past. We're not going to use as many people as, as we ever have done making any type of item, manufacturing a particular item, and we need to understand that. And so that's my comment, that uh, that's why it's so important for the media to help educate the public on these natural forces occurring so that we don't have people who are blaming other, other ethnic groups, citizens from other countries, or globalization. Uh, certainly the world is a lot more complicated uh, and globalization has re re resulted in some dislocation of jobs, but not to the degree that many Americans think and not to the degree that many people around the world in other countries think. And so I just think that uh, um, we need to be more understanding of that, and that's the role of media. So I'm going to just uh, obviously the role of banks and financing is a part of that as well. But in terms of just the di reduction of jobs in America, it's not because of the role of banks, but it's really global trade. But not so much even global trade. It's the fact that with automation and productivity. Uh, information technology that in the future that will reduce the number of people that is required just to do the same basic things. Just to do the same basic things. And people are afraid of change. Okay, put your hands up clearly so we can get the microphones to you. The gentleman there was next and then this gentleman here. Thank you. Philip Merrill from the Business Year Publication. Uh, I was wondering if we could offer the question uh, that was uh, about populism. I think it was to uh, Mr. McGee, um, to the former Prime Minister. Um, seen as your country is on a crossroads, um, seemingly between taking a populist route and, and taking one of, um, let's say, stability. Do you agree with the analysis that there is a very thin line between popular and populist? And what have, if so, what, has, uh, what have Italy's political elites done to fail the, the, the population um, to, to bring out this outcome? Signor Renzi. Yeah, it's for you, yeah. Thank you. The question about populism is uh, really interesting. Uh, I agree with respect to the relation between populism and uh, popularism. Uh, in the ancient, in the, in the old Rome, the word populus 
changed meaning in the course of century. When Rome was founded, populus was the very important, the, the, the most important thing. Senatus, populus, queroman. Populus was the, 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 the pillar of the history of Rome. When in the first century after Christ, Christus arrived Seneca, Seneca used the expression populus with a bad meaning. Populus became populism, we can say, with the expression of today. Why? Because I think it's normal in the life change the perspective, but the sense is always the same in the last 20 centuries. What is? Or you are able to involve the populace, the people, in the leading the nation, the government, the country, or you risk to lose the relation and the connection with them. Unfortunately, also in Italy, we lost, and in a, a lot, in, in, in a part of Europe, we lost this relation, this connection with the people, and then permit to populism to win. But it's not easy to give the same definition of populism, because uh, Trump is populist, because uh, in uh, South America there is uh, populism. It's the same populism, uh, the populism of Trump and the populism of uh, Evo Morales. is the same, the populism of Podemos, at the populism of uh, Eastern European countries? No, it's not the same. It's very different. So we call the populism with the same expression a lot of different things. I believe that. We need a different relation between people and government everywhere. Everywhere. From China to United States, from Europe to Australia. And for that is absolutely crucial the role of media and the communication. Populism and media are very, very important relation. I stop with that. If we think about populism in the course of centuries, you, you discovered a lot of incredible stories. Mr. Lord Mayor, I'm sorry, I, I, I was your colleague because I, mayor of, I was mayor of Florence. I think Florence is the best city around the world. Uh, it's impossible to say here in Almaty, but uh, I, I, we are colleagues. And uh, when I think about populism in the history of my, count, my city, I remember a very good uh, history about Michelangelo. I conclude with that. Michelangelo was maybe the most important artist, uh, one of the most important genius with Leonardo. It's an incredible period called the Renaissance in Florence. Okay. But politicians think, oh, we, we have to give uh, the message to artists. We have to decide for the artist. We have to impose to the artist what is beauty, what is not beauty. And when Michelangelo, young artist, uh, realized the masterpiece, the David, an incredible masterpiece, the symbol of Florence at the Anatoly of Florence, the politician, the mayor of the past, the Gonfaloniere, the name was Soderini, visited the uh, place of job, the work, and uh, gave the message, gave the message. No, the nose of David is not so beautiful. The young artist was very in trouble. Oh, there is the powerful uh, mayor who decided the nose is not good. Two hours of discussion between the young artist and the powerful mayor. The conclusion was a compromise. Michelangelo decided to change the nose, in theory. In the pocket, he, he brought the, the, the little powder and uh, with the, 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 the leather arrived to the nose of David, used to, to he, he, he 
try, he gave the message to change the nose, but the nose remained exactly the same. And a little powder uh, uh, put out uh, from nose uh, with a fake uh, 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 news, <laughs> with a fake uh, message. And uh, when he came back to the ground, the mayor, okay, now is okay. So what is the sense? Every era of the history, in every time of the history, we have the people who think to give a message of populism, of different populism. The sense is respect really the connection between the citizens and the governor. And I think this is not easy and this is not easy in my country and in Europe, particularly in this moment. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Riz, can I just... Uh, Very words? quickly, please, sir. Excuse me. Um, I think, uh, as um, uh, Mr. Renzi uh, said, populism has always existed. It's not something that is uh, today's phenomenon. Um, and populism is fine and it has its place. <clears throat> When, uh, and is, is not a source of danger when the state or the country or the society is sound and balanced and everything functions, uh, relationships especially. Populism becomes a problem when it starts turning into rabble-rousers and starts turning into mm, a national socialism or whatever other type of extreme ideology. That's when because populism is yeah. actually the source. It's a benign, mm -hmm. benign uh, virus yeah. that's there, but then it, it can turn into something. Just a small anecdote. Uh, there was a question about nationalism or populism. Uh, in Soviet times, uh, we Georgians used to always ask, or frequently ask the question, why is it that when a Russian loves his country, it's patriotism, and when a Georgian loves his country, it's nationalism? Interesting. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Good morning. Thank you very much. I'm Konstantinos Margaritis from Greece for Maxia newspaper. Congratulations on the organization committee for this uh, wonderful meeting. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, next year we have a European election. What's your opinion about, uh, about the new priorities of Europe, first of all? And uh, for the other members of the uh, panel, what do you believe about the, uh, the priorities and, uh, of course, the relationships between Europe and Asia? Thank you very much. All right. So, quick question on Europe, then we'll do that first. I guess, Prime Minister, uh, former Prime Minister uh, Renzi. Very briefly, I think for Europe the priority is not economy. An Italian who give this answer to a Greek journalist is not, <laughs> is not, uh, is not normal. <laughs> but I believe that because I remember the night in July 2015 when a part of European leaders try to put out Greece from Europe. And I remember, not only myself, myself with other colleagues, who gave this answer. This is a stupid thing. Stupid. Because Europe, without... Greek values, without Greek culture, without Greek contribution, is not Europe. It's a very important board of company. But Europe is not a company. Europe is a community. A community of value, of ideals, of uh, dreams, not nightmares. Dreams. So my view for the next election, also to give an answer to populism, is exactly that give a message of new identity in Europe. And uh, this uh, means, uh, obviously, attention about debt, about deficit, about uh, parameters and values, but also about human values, human identity, human culture. Uh, I think that without any a story, it's impossible to understand, to, to, to go a message for the future. Uh, I finish with the last example, uh, but it's not an European example, it's an American example. This is the 
50th anniversary of uh, 1968, a very important year for revolution, uh, for France, for Europe, for Italy, but also for the United States, for the death, the terrible death of Bob Kennedy and for the terrible death of Martin Luther King. If here we discussed about uh, the first momentum, the momentum of a great uh, uh, initiative of Martin Luther King, everyone may be thinking about Rosa Parks, a young woman, black woman, who decide to maintain her place in the bus in a place dedicated to white people. She decided, I, I remain here. And she put in jail. And uh, the black movement have an incredible, uh, uh, powerful uh, uh, start with this terrible event. Martin Luther King was the great leader of this, uh, this process. Okay. Nobody remembered Nine months before, nine months before, March 1955, a young black woman, Claudette, I think was the name, made exactly the same thing. But nobody remembered her. She was uh, put in jail. The leader of black movement arrived, but they decided to don't defend her as nine months after they defend uh, uh, Rosa Parks. Why? Because Claudette, she's a, she was pregnant without husband in America of 1955. So every event of history needs a framework, a context, and the capacity and the ability to tell an history. Only who is able to tell the history, is able also to write history. I think Europe today is in trouble because nobody tell history. We need storytelling in Europe. Storyteller, it's impossible with deficit and that. We need the value, we need the great dream, we need a vision and not only the vision. I think this is a priority for a European election next year. I would ask Simon to comment on this. <laughs> just uh, what story is Britain going to tell in the years to come? <laughs> um, well, just to answer the, the uh, gentleman's question, I mean, uh, who am I as a Brit to tell the Greeks uh, what their relationship with, with Europe should be? Um, uh, and without wanting to sound German, I, th I think, uh, you know, clearly the, the, the country does, in my opinion, need to get its house in order. Uh, and then uh, by doing so, will be a stronger uh, member of the Euro European Union. Um, but I mean, you just look at what Greece is doing at the moment with the, with the migration crisis. I mean, it's doing a, a humongous amount um, for, the, for the entire continent. Uh, and, I, and, uh, and I think that sometimes gets, um, gets lost uh, in the very technical conversations uh, that have been had recently, as, as Mr. Renzi said. Um, sorry, Riz, what was your... Well, it's really exactly? just a question of what story will Britain tell you know, now when you look at how Europe, the story of Europe as... Yeah, so, so the story at the moment is very much about the sort of technical um, arguments between Brussels and London on what uh, the future relationship is going to look like. Um, I, I certainly think that we need to get beyond that. And I, and I speak as someone who wanted to remain in the European Union but worked for a foreign secretary who took Britain out of the European Union or will take Britain out of the European Union. Um, I, I think that... Um, uh, that, that, that the country as a whole is beginning to look further afield, is beginning to think about what does Britain's relationship with the rest of the world look like. And I think, uh, I think it starts with having a very close and strong relationship with the European Union and, uh, and to continue doing so, particularly not just through uh, NATO, which of course the UK will be a will continue to be a key contributor, but also uh, in other foreign and security um, defense matters. Um, so I think the, the relationship, you know, uh, Britain is still tied to Europe. Britain is still in Europe. Britain is not leaving. It's not being pulled away into the middle of the, the Atlantic or off into the Pacific or, you know, it is, it is still there. It is still uh, 30 kilometers off the coast of France. There is still a tunnel underneath. Um, uh, we are still tied to um, our European neighbors and will continue to be. And I know that um, even the most uh, ardent of, of Brexiteers uh, wants that relationship to remain incredibly close, incredibly strong uh, for, for, for all of the reasons that, that everyone here can imagine.
I want to, we had so many subjects to discuss in this, in this session, and of course we got quite heavily into the populism uh, debate. What I do want to do is just very quickly go on a couple of key, key issues that I'd like to touch on now. They will feature later in the, uh, in the forum. And perhaps uh, to Minister Abdrakhmanov and to uh, Ambassador Gary Locke, I could also put this. Um, what we're seeing is tensions uh, building up again between Russia and the US, between China and the US, and then we also have China and Russia kind of vying for power in this part of the world too. So I wanted to get your perspective on that, sir, Minister, first, and then I'll bring in the ambassador. Okay, thank you. This is very much a relevant uh, question and issue to that particular moment at the developments in Central Asia. I'm specifically mentioning Central Asia as soon as we are now in the region are passing through a sort of you know, renaissance of, uh, in our uh, regional cooperation. And this is due to the joint endeavor of the leaders of Central Asian states to serve to the purposes of humanity, to set up an example of the zone of peace, security, stability, and sustainable development. And I do believe that we have every chance to prove before the rest of the world, especially before the regions which are now facing so many challenges and threats of transnational law, other kind of nature, that there is a place in the world where you, they could come freely with a very much secure investment, secured investments to the economy of that country to enjoy the local, how we call it in, uh, you know, generally, local hospitality, to enjoy the ancient Silk Road. And this is bringing us back to the geographic location of my country, of Kazakhstan and Central Asia. You are right, uh, it's China, and I mentioned to you that quite, uh, until recently, two, two or 25 years ago, it was a, still a line of division between China and Soviet Union. It is the Russian Federation. Only Kazakhstan itself has a 7,500 plus kilometers of border between us. I already mentioned these statistics that this is a just distance between JFK and Heathrow. So you can imagine uh, what, what kind of border of peace, people to people exchange like in the case of um, uh, China, free trade and investments under the scope of the Eurasian Economic Union. And notably, it was last week when Eurasian Economic Union and China reached a deal. Uh, yes, it was just preliminary step, just very much maybe premature to predict how it will evolve. But we are entering to maybe in the nearest future to the arrangements uh, which, uh, ca you know, by which ca uh, characterized so-called free trade zones. Can you imagine if we will unite our efforts of Eurasian Economic Zone China and needless to say about engagement of some other actors next to Central Asia. But our headache, of course, Afghanistan. Afghanistan is a, you know, we, we at least we made an effort and we, I believe, proved in January of this year at the Security Council that Afghanistan should not be considered as a, you know, battlefield between and among some above mentioned many actors. It is a, not territory where so many threats and challenges emanating from. The, the drug trafficking, the terrorism, extremism, etc. But this is a potentially it is a partner, partner for trade, investments, for cultural exchange, etc., etc. So, and we invite all, you know, stakeholders, those who can influence in positive way to the development, both in Afghanistan, in Central Asia, in Kazakhstan, in particular, in particular, to unite their efforts. It's easy to say, uh, then you know to reach some particular, uh, um, particular results. But it, if you remember, the first scene on screen, it was about North Korea. It was Kazakhstan which set up an example to North Koreans, as well as to some other, uh, you know, uh, nations, that there is a possibility, not just simply to go get rid of a nuclear arsenal or to shut down, and it was, by the way, the Semipalatian's largest new nuclear polygon in Central in the world, Semipalatinsk uh, uh, was, uh, you know, closed by the decree of President Nazarbayev, which was signed during the our Soviet time. Mm -hmm. So we are giving an example, uh, the best ever uh, maybe example to the countries like 
North Korea that there is a potential. If you abandon your nuclear legacy, you have every right to become like Kazakhstan, one, one of the most prosperous uh, uh, nations in the region. And from that perspective, if you take a look at the, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, foreign direct investments which Kazakhstan managed to attract during its independence. We are talking about 200 billion plus per capita. It's higher than maybe in Central and Eastern Europe. Just how it distributed? Half of that investments and trade coming from, just guess, European Union. Half. The rest, China, Russian Federation, United States, Britain, United Kingdom is one of the major investment investors to, uh, uh, to, to Kazakh Kazakhstan. That's why we are not just uh, we are really looking after this Brexit and other developments in your part of the world. So, so coming back, this is a sort of when we are talking about uh, Kazakh diaspora abroad, we always uh, uh, mentioning Golden Bridge. Now maybe it's my chance also to mention that Kazakhstan could serve as a golden bridge and literally <coughs> between uh, not only these nations which you mentioned but uh, with many other nations those who aspired to uh, cooperate with my country thank you thank you minister uh, ambassador Lok, just a quick thought on this uh Russian-Chinese rivalry now perhaps for this part of the world, but also knowing how China works well, of course there's the, the tensions with the U.S. too. Well, I think that the, China's relationship with the world has often been uh, based on its economic needs and its political needs. Uh, certainly uh, after the outbreak of World War II or the conclusion of World War II, uh, Communist China and, and Communist Russia were obviously aligned uh, and uh, presenting a common front against the United States. Uh, when uh, and it was because of the close ties between the United States, between China and, and the Soviet Union that it was President Carter and the U.S. administration that wanted to recognize, uh, uh, reestablish diplomatic relations with China to try to break China from the uh, Soviet sphere. Uh, but I think that really when you see China's accession to the WTO uh, in the early 2000s, ever since then China's economy has grown uh, astronomically with the opening up policies of Deng Xiaoping, enabling it to become the number two economy in the world. And from that position of strength, it is now able to pick and choose its alliances for very specific reasons, whether it's going to be on economics or whether it's going to be based on petroleum uh, and in some cases on geopolitics. Uh, certainly uh, China and the Soviet Union or Russia are very much aligned and working together and in concert on its, with respect to Syria. Uh, versus the United States and some of the other Western countries. And yet at the same time, China is a key economic partner with the United States. I mean, they are so economically interdependent. Uh, China exports more to the United States than to all the EU countries combined. And, the, and for China, uh, or for the United States, China is America's number one export destination for all that we grow on our farms and, and all that we produce within our and process in our agricultural sector. So they are hugely economically interdependent. At the same time, getting back to this issue of populism and nationalism, China has a great nationalism. They very much want to restore their place in the world and erase the centuries of shame at the, at the hands of the Western powers and even uh, at the isolationist policies of some of the last uh, um, uh, emperors of China. And so they are on a mission to reassert themselves and reestablish their place in world history and in world civilization. Uh, that is why, for instance, now with their economic strength, they're embarking on the One Belt, One Road initiative and forming alliances with many other countries throughout the world, whether in Africa or Central uh, Asia. Uh, and other parts of Europe. I wanted to bring in Mr. Al Jarwan here as, and ask, really sitting there in the Gulf in the middle of the world, you're watching these things flying across once, you know, the, the rhetoric flying one side to the other. How you see um, the Gulf region positioned as a player in this east-west kind of realignment? Well, thank you very much. Actually, <coughs> the Gulf countries are, have many friends in the west and in the north. And I think they are, especially if I'm talking about United Arab Emirates, it's a hub of uh, transferring uh, uh, yani, uh, culture and also uh, trades for, for uh, Africa and between 
here and there. So, politically, I think we are just watching what will, uh, will happen. Now, you know, it's, 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 it's difficult to, to interfere and it's difficult to, to also to, uh, uh, to be in line with one part and the other. So, of course, it's always good to stay neutral, but I wonder with, yeah. with America becoming a little more introspective in some ways with President Trump, whether the East now affords a greater opportunity. You know, the, the politics is always changing. So, uh, for, for us, I think... Have to stay on your toes. Stand <laughs> and just wait, yeah, yeah. Right. Felix, I'm sorry. Um, Riz, can I just challenge you on the sort of the United States being more introspective okay. for a second? Because I, I think, you know, in, on one level, yes, you could say the US has become more introspective. There's talk of, a, you know, the wall, there's... Um, uh, uh, there's this trade war which has been done seem for, for domestic purposes, to, for, for, for Trump's base, um, for, for, to, to, for him to deliver the promises he made to the people who elected him. Um, but I think it's also worth remembering that actually in some respects the U.S. has been far more involved than it was before. It, uh, it is actually uh, upping its activity, uh, its uh, uh, commitment to Afghanistan. Um, at the beginning of the, uh, the Trump presidency, the president said that he would actually potentially withdraw from the United Nations, that they might not be as committed to NATO as they used to be. Actually, that commitment has remained strong. Uh, and if anything, they've used the United Nations Security Council more than anyone thought. Uh, I mean, I'll give you an example. At the moment with North Korea, um, I like to think that actually it was the United Nations uh, uh, activity, it was the US getting a resolution on uh, restricting uh, North Korea's access to funds from its uh, from its exports that I think has had more of a uh, has had a, that's made a bigger difference with where we are with North Korea right now uh, than than a few tweets. So so yes, in one sense there is a sense of introspection, but then but then also you could argue that actually the Trump presidency has has been a lot more outwards looking and a lot more involved uh, than the US was previously. It's just a, just, just a challenge. That. That. And perhaps stirring it up is the way. I have to actually, I have to apologize because I'm, I'm always so firm about the timekeeping and I can't afford to overrun. So I have to apologize to Mr. Basel and the others who put their hands up because we do have to end this session. But please save your questions for the, the next ones coming up. They all connect. A big round of applause, please, for our uh, panelists there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for asking.